So our learning target, we're going to focus on just the first part today, identify key battles in Europe, including D-Day, and assess its impacts. Tomorrow we will work on the Battle of the Bulge. But for today, you're going to be using your fill-in-the-blank notes to follow along. I've used an outlining method so that you can always go back and match your fill-in-the-blank notes with where we are in the slides. So right now we are in section 1, Roman numeral I, section 1, and we're talking about Operation Overlord. Operation Overlord is the code name for the Allied invasion in northern France. It was originally scheduled for spring 1944, and the goal was to land along the beaches of Normandy using the English Channel. So we would use Britain as our staging area, get everything set and ready, cross the short uh, water journey, and arrive in northern France. The lead commander is a four-star general for the United States. His name is Dwight D. Eisenhower, and he will later become our president. This is a very famous image of future President Eisenhower right here. And then here you can see this is where we did our staging on the southern part of England. And this is the region of Normandy in northwest France that we are going to try to land on so that we can start pushing um, this way. This would be east. So we're going to land here in northern France with the goal of being able to push east into Germany. The training for the invasion was very intense, extremely detailed, and we're using a lot of equipment. It's 175,000 men with 1,000 transport planes, 5,000 ships, 6,000 fighters and bombers. Um, and the Allies were very aware um, of the German positions and exactly what they were getting into. By no means was it a surprise when we landed on the beaches and found that the Germans held the high ground. The Allies knew all of these positions. They planned for this, and they were prepared and ready to storm these beaches despite knowing all of the danger involved. As part of Operation Overlord, there was kind of a secret, sort of somewhat secret, um, operation as well called Operation Fortitude. Operation Fortitude was a trick um, to make it look like the place that the invasion would be landing would be uh, Pas de Calais, or just Calais, um, which is at the closest point. Um, between Britain and France, and we used all kinds of props, essentially, to make it look like that's where we were going to be landing. It worked. The Germans kept most of their troops there at Calais, uh, and even pulled some troops out of Normandy, and were uh, very surprised to find that the tanks were inflatable and the jeeps were made out of cardboard. One of the main challenges for... Operation Overlord was the Atlantic Wall. So you're going to hear the name Rommel a couple of times. Rommel was the German military's leader, essentially. Um, and he is credited as being one of the great tacticians. We're actually going to close today's lecture talking about him. And the Atlantic Wall was everything that was built up along the coast of France against the Atlantic. And they had built all of these different hazards to try to prevent a um, invasion of France from the sea. So there are these giant pillboxes, pillboxes and bunkers. They, these are these fortified positions. Some of them are still standing today. You can tell because this picture is in color. Um, and they used all kinds of different bunkers and fortified positions so that as they held the high ground up on the hills overlooking the sea, they would be protected enough to hold those positions. So D-Day, the actual name of the operation for D-Day is Operation Neptune. It's become known as D-Day, but any day of an operation is D-Day. It was known at the time as Operation Neptune. It took place on June 6, 1944, initially scheduled for June 5th, but the weather did not quite cooperate. Um, it was a little too foggy, but even on June 6th, it was still very foggy, and the operation begins very early in the morning. Their goal is to secure 50 miles of the coastline and then begin to push inward. The first part of the plan was to drop paratroopers behind the beaches to prevent German reinforcements from coming from behind. The army rangers are going to be dropped in to um, attack a German stronghold at Pont du Hoc, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then the infantry will storm the beaches. So there's kind of a three-prong approach to being able to, to take this 50 miles of coastline. 
So these paratroopers, we'll start by talking about them. They um, were dropped behind what would, be, would become known as Utah Beach to secure bridges and to prevent a German advance. That's the 101st. The 82nd, they were dropped inland, and they were meant to prevent a German advance from the west. Again, because Rommel was super smart, um, he had thought about lots of different ways that this invasion could go down. So he built this giant Atlantic wall, but he also flooded these fields so that if there were to be paratroopers, they would be weighed down in these flooded fields. Um, the average paratrooper was carrying 70 pounds of equipment, and the officers, they carried 90 pounds. Most of the supplies didn't actually supply the jump. They were for once they got on the ground to be able to do what they needed to do. Um, some men dropped into these flooded fields, and they actually drowned because they were so weighed down by these packs. I have some really cool pictures on this next slide. Um, so there was heavy anti-aircraft fire. Um, and you can see, as you're looking at what a paratrooper looked like at the time, they weren't very camouflaged. Um, one out of every six men didn't make it to the ground. They were killed in the air. But they were still able to capture the areas that they needed to. This is um, at a museum, which is why it looks like dummies, because it is. But it gives you an idea of just how much equipment they were carrying with them. Um, here we see them victorious after they took over um, a German position and then doing a little bit of camouflage. So the next part is Pont du Hoc. Um, and they, this is the Army Rangers, and they are going to essentially climb a cliff to try to take German artillery that's overlooking the landing zone. They used hooks, ropes, and ladders. It takes most of the rangers about five minutes. All of them make it within 15, and they are scaling a 100-foot cliff. Um, if you're thinking about, well, the Germans are at the top and the Americans are coming up and they're using this equipment, why don't they just throw the equipment off the cliff? Um, the rangers tied fuses to them and lit them, making the Germans think that they were explosives when, in fact, they were not. Um, and they are able to take over this position. The goal is to take this high ground that overlooks some of the landing zone beaches. The Germans had this very fortified system. Um... And they were able to use their resources, essentially, um, to fortify their position. So the American Navy had been bombing this area, and it created these large craters that they could use for cover. Turned out when they got there that um, the Germans had done a little switcheroo, too. And the guns that they were supposed to be going to get or destroy were actually um, decoys as well. So the rangers will proceed further inland and secure crossroads to prevent any reinforcements from reaching the Omaha Beach. They found the German artillery, um, but it had been moved a kilometer inland, and that artillery is quickly disabled. Um, the Germans and the rangers fight back and forth basically for two days. It drops the number of men from 225 or more to just 90. To give you an idea of the cliffs, here you go. This is about 100 feet. You can see all of these bombardment holes from artillery. And then these trenches. Here are some of the um, reinforced areas. And then this is one of those trenches with a person in it. That's my friend who's also a history teacher. So a person for scale, as you can see, just how big these um, craters really are. This is something that you will see again. I can guarantee it. I will ask you who had what beaches. Um, so at the very early hours of June 6, 1944, before dawn, landing craft begin making runs to the beaches. The United States, the name for their beaches, um, were Utah and Omaha. The British had two beaches, Gold and Sword, and the Canadians also had a beach. The name for their beach is Juno. These are not the names of the beaches that people in France were like, oh, let's go down to Utah Beach. These were our strategic names and our cover names um, for the operation for Operation Neptune.
Before we can even talk about hitting the beach, we have to deal with the obstacles. So the Atlantic Wall wasn't just um, using the the pillboxes, but there were all kinds of defenses along the beach. This image does a really good job, and then I have it a little bit bigger on the next slide, showing you some of these different hazards along the way. If the tide was high, all of this was covered. Um, if the tide was low, all of this was uncovered. There are these Belgian gates. I have a slide about those. Teller mines, they were covered at high tide, um, so the ships didn't know that they were there. We've got a couple of different just kind of metal annoyances, barbed wire and minefields. Then we have the pillboxes with the uh, machine guns and anti-tank guns, and then the concrete bunkers. So it's not just so simple as walking onto a beach. Here's one of those uh, hazards. They're called hedgehogs. Um, these are probably the ones that people think of the most when they think about D-Day, um, and they're the ones that you'll most often see in film. Hazards called Belgian gates, which kind of lock together to create like a fence, but they were also reinforced from behind, so they were hard to get around. Um, and they, if you actually take a look here, top view, we've got all of these hazards before you've even made it into the beach itself. So the runs begin at 5.30 and troops begin the assault at 6.30. So they're on these boats for about a half, a half hour to an hour. Um, the boats are called Higgins boats. They are the ones that we think of when we think about D-Day. Um, some of these ships had a tough time reaching there um, because of all of these mines and hazards before they've even hit the beach. And the men carried very large and very heavy packs with them. It slowed them down. If you weren't a strong swimmer and you got turned over, they could be pulled down. Um, and when we talk about the war in the Pacific, I'll share a story about my grandfather who fought in the Pacific, um, who struggled with this exact thing and never went in the water again. Each of the experiences at the beaches were a little bit different. Um, Utah Beach, they attacked from there, and it's not that... It's not interesting. We just think most about uh, Omaha Beach. The Americans that landed at Utah were led by someone whose name you know. Uh, his name is, or his rank is Brigadier General, and he was the son of Theodore Roosevelt. They landed a mile from the intended target, and they were successful by midday. The British landed at Gold Beach. They landed about an hour after the men landed on Omaha and Utah. They had... Um, the use of these, they're called Hobart's Funnies, and they really do look funny, um, to clear mines and obstacles, so they had somewhat of a different job to do. They capture this city called Aramanche, um, and they will later use that as a way to provide reinforcements and supplies. So these are Hobart's Funnies, they really do look funny, and they had these kind of defensive things to to blow up mines in front of them and protect the men. And so it looks ridiculous. So Aramanche is at Gold Beach and they are going to build these artificial harbors to be able to move, here you see ambulances, move men and supplies in and out without always having to rely on ships and the tides. The Canadians had particularly tough fighting at Juneau. Within the first hour of fighting, half of the Canadians were dead. They did not have the support of these tanks, um, but the further inland they moved, the less resistance they met. The The Canadian story of D-Day is, is one that is not well told, but very interesting. The reason why Canada is involved um, in World War II has nothing to do with their proximity to the United States and has everything to do with being a Commonwealth country of Britain. They ran a separate military, but they were part of the same mission. Sword Beach, uh, where the British landed, they had followed some of the same ideas that we had. They dropped paratroopers behind the lines to be able to capture a bridge um, to prevent reinforcements. They used those tanks that were able to disarm some of the hazards on the beach. They moved inland quickly, but were pushed back to the beaches uh, by a German advance. The last is Omaha Beach. What we think of, I think, 
uh, when we think about D-Day. Um, it's the worst fighting of the day. And even though the intelligence was really good about where the positions were, they vastly underestimated the number of Germans that were going to be able to defend that beach. The naval bombardment, though it helped some of the other beaches, did not help at Omaha Beach. Only two of 29 tanks made it onto shore, and the first wave of men who hit Omaha Beach had a 90% casualty rate. Very quickly, officers were killed and wounded. So many men were killed that the commander at the time thought about maybe just pulling out um, and giving up, and all in all, 2,400 men were killed or lost on Omaha Beach. For those of you who are interested in, in learning more, and especially if you have a strong stomach, on my YouTube playlist, for World War II D-Day, um, I have clips of Saving Private Ryan, which is a fantastic film, but it's just really intense um, and is too much for most people, frankly. Um, but the the videos are there of the Operation Neptune landing on the beach. You get a really good picture of what the Higgins boats were like, what the mines and the hazards are like, and it is a very intense, very visceral experience as you're watching it. It's not for everyone. By no means is it required that you watch it, but it is there for you if it's something that you're interested in learning a little bit more about. There were so many men that were killed that there is an American cemetery. It's actually American soil in France, and it looks over. So you can kind of see here just how high the high ground is. You can see that better in this image than this one. I put this image in here because it does a really good job of overlaying what it currently looks like with what it looked like on the day, and you can see the scale of the ships and the trucks and all of these different things coming ashore. The next slide has some intense images on it. It might not be for you. Um, this is a very famous photograph. It was a Pulitzer Prize winning photograph of a soldier. You can see the hazards in the background, some of these hedgehogs and things. Here's another hazard with one of our soldiers. Um, and you can see here that even the ships were not immune, and there was a lot of cleanup, uh, for lack of a better word, to do on the beach. D-Day by the numbers, 156,000 men landed on D-Day. Casualties by beach, Utah Beach, 589. Sword Beach, a little more than 1,300. Gold, a little more than 1,000. Juno, a little more than 1,200. And Omaha Beach, in total, 3,686. German casualties in total 9,000, and 200,000 Germans were captured and became prisoners of war. It took until June 12th to unify or connect control of all of these beaches to gain that advantage of having the 50 miles of coastline to be able to control. In the photos that you see here, I have a couple of different uh, images of cemeteries that are in Normandy. There were, uh, deaths were at such an intense scale that the men were buried there instead of returning them home. Obviously, that's different than what we do today. Um, but they are separate from one another, um, but they are nearby to one another. So this is the American Cemetery here, and we are very familiar, I think, with these images of the white crosses. This is the German cemetery. Their crosses look, obviously, they look different. They're reminiscent of the Iron Cross, and they're this kind of raw black stone. So to wrap up, and we're going to... I made a mistake. It should say Roman numeral 3. Roman numeral 3. I'm going to start here with... Uh, it should say Roman numeral 3. Don't get confused. It's Roman numeral 3. So we're going to talk a little bit about something that's happening just the next month. It's called Operation Valkyrie, and this is completely unrelated to D-Day, but it's interesting nonetheless, and it gives us a couple of really great stories. So there were a number of plots to assassinate Hitler from within his leadership and from within his party. This is the last and also possibly the most successful attempt on Hitler's life. On the morning of July 20th in 1944, a bomb is placed in a briefcase under the table at Hitler's da daily briefing in the goal of um, killing Hitler. Uh, it fails, which only serves to make Hitler feel like he's invincible and special and all of these different things. Um, Hitler was particularly interested in ideas about the occult, and he believed that he was sort of a superior being. He saw himself as being somewhat more than human. So this bomb goes off. 
and everyone is assuming that Hitler's dead. So these senior officers attempt to take power and free Germany from the Nazis, um, but they are Nazis, but it's a little bit different, I guess we can say. So some military areas follow through. They didn't know that the plot had failed. They're going to detain members of the Schutzstaffel um, and the Gestapo. So that's the secret police. The Schutzstaffel began as Hitler's kind of bodyguards, but they're the ones who run the camps. And However, Hitler survives, and so the mission fails. The conspirators are punished. Here's a guy uh, holding the uniform. Um, and then this is actually what it looked like inside the room after. So it was quite a substantial event. Hitler only named one person as a conspirator, but there's one particular historical figure who is going to be implicated in being aware of the plot. And this is Erwin Rommel. He was the general field marshal of Germany. He was the top military commander. He had led the Germans to immense success in the desert campaigns in northern Africa early on in the war, and he was an incredible military tactician. He was called the Desert Fox because they had performed so well throughout northern Africa, and he was seen as being very smart and cunning like a fox. He was implicated as being aware of the plot. Whether or not he was is very uh, contentious. He was given the opportunity to avoid the humiliation of a public trial and a very public execution, which would have been damaging not only to his own reputation as a military leader, but also to his family. They would have had to live with the shame of this event. He was given the opportunity to quietly commit suicide um, and then be buried with military honors and in Hitler's good graces as far as anybody knew. And so if you're interested in military tactics or anything like that, I would encourage you to read into Rommel a little bit more. If it's something that you're interested in, let me know. I'll throw you a couple resources. So I'm leaving it here because, um, well, in part because I just think that this story is interesting, but also to show that although Hitler was in control in a lot of ways, by this point, 1944, the fanaticism and the cohesive movement of the Nazi party had begun to fall apart. And over the next year, less than a year, the Allies are going to move very quickly. And by April 1945, Hitler's dead. And by the very beginning of May, the war in Europe is over. So things start to happen really quickly after D-Day. So what I've asked you to do for your learning target is to identify key battles in Europe, including D-Day, and assess the impacts. What are some impacts of the Battle of D-Day? What did it achieve? What did it cost? What technology was used? And what did it enable American soldiers to be able to do? The Allies are going to move very quickly throughout Europe, and that's where we will pick things up tomorrow.